Welcome back to Martins and More. My name is Mari Rutsch. And I'm Spoon Phillips. And we have a lot to talk about today. How you doing, Spoon? I am doing very well. And one of the things we have to talk about is this historic occasion. I'm not sure when this podcast is going to air, but it's actually being recorded on Friday the 13th of January, 2023. And you are there. So here's our trivia question right off the bat, which we'll answer right off the bat. So <laughs> what do famous comic actor and highly respected acting teacher Charles Nelson Riley and famous dramatic actor and TV presenter Robert Stack and the extremely talented Fred White, the drummer for Earth, Wind, and Fire for the first 10 years of their existence, all have in common with Mari Rutsch of Mari's Music. I give up. Happy birthday to you. Wow, we got a little Whitney Houston out of Spoon Phillips for that. Thank you so much. <laughs> You're very welcome. Many happy returns on the day. I am sure that all of those famous people, had they still been alive, would be proud to share their date of birth with such an upstanding citizen and fabulous guitar player and all around good egg as... Mari Rich. So happy birthday. Do we have to listen to you? <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you very much, Spoon. I'll tell you, there's no place I'd rather be on my birthday than recording a podcast with you. <laughs> well, think. that's kind of you to say. Yeah. <laughs> I think. <laughs> well, <laughs> and you know, you and you know, you know, birthdays are uh, similar to like New Year's Eve. Birthdays are often a time of reflection and then another trip starting around the sun and time for people to start thinking about doing things like general maintenance to uh, make sure the coming year is going to go as well and as healthy as possible. And a lot of people forget that uh, finely made acoustic guitars also need regular maintenance and annual checkups and things like that to ensure that they're going to be at their best too. Well, I do agree with some of that, but I got to tell you, you mentioned about going around the sun again. I'm a flat earther, so this might not work. <laughs> fair enough. Fair but enough. I'm going to put aside my scientific beliefs. Or lack thereof. <laughs> I'm going to I'm going to pretend I believe what you believe just for this next hour. This is going to be a really good show, and I totally agree with everything you said, including the science. We're going to get very scientific today. When you buy a brand new Martin guitar or similar guitar built to the level of construction and perfection and the the quality you get when you buy an instrument of that caliber you're not bringing home an inanimate object you're bringing home a part of the family and you've got to take care of this thing and the responsibilities that you bring with it are not just open the case play the guitar forget about it you do need to take it seriously and if you want to keep your instrument in tip-top shape keep all of the problems at bay anything small that does seem to arise. Not to say you want to buy the guitar and immediately start to worry, but you must be conscious of what the guitar is going to go through as far as temperature, humidity, and just the way that the guitar is going to forget it was a tree and begin remembering it's a piece of musical history. There are things you want to be able to do and warning signs you want to watch for. We definitely do have to talk about care and feeding, cleaning, and general guitar maintenance today. And if you have a fondness for that subject, don't go anywhere because it's going to be a good show. Well, yes, and you use the uh, term care and feeding, and that is something that Martin has used uh, as the name of their little guide that they provide uh, guitar owners when they first get their new Martin guitar. And, you know, that kind of implies it's a pet. And there have been other people that have kind of referred to their guitars like their pets. And you said a member of the family. and. And just like pets, some people understand that, you know, some sort of Alaskan sled dog 
uh, maybe a little more rugged and can take care of itself compared to the little Pekingese that their grandmother has. But um, some people really pamper their pets and other people do not. And I think we'll kind of start with the pampering now uh, and then we can get in some of the more serious stuff because you also use that expression about the guitar having to forget that it's a tree. So um, we're going to get into the the structural stuff and the need to take care of a guitar to prevent serious problems a little bit later. But first, I'd like to talk about uh, the care in terms of, well, it's a topic that a lot of people don't even think about, and that is actually bathing the guitar or cleaning the guitar, things that you can do to keep up its appearance that are also good for it in the same way that polishing your teeth at a dentist is as much more about uh, protecting it from getting cavities than it is making it look good. So when somebody says to you, do I need to clean my guitar? And if so, how do I do it? What, what would you tell them? What do you tell your customers? It's, it's fair to say there are different kinds of people and different levels of care. I, I have to almost wonder that some people listening to this show recognize that I've played a 1998 OM28V all my life, and you might think I'm the last person that should tell anybody how to take care of a guitar, keep a guitar clean. That's one of those instruments that I ended up taking very good care of it for about a year, but I'm from the camp that I wanted to play my guitar everywhere I was, so I brought it out and made it my gigging guitar. And to fast forward to a very important point, that guitar got marred and nicked up pretty quickly in its life that the honeymoon was sort of over already. By the time I wanted to take a lot of care and be very serious about keeping it clean, it was already pretty scratched, and I took it upon myself to let that guitar be the, for lack of a better term, road-worn and I sort of fell into the romantic idea of that guitar is going to be a worker, it's going to be a workhorse, and I cared less about it looking showroom new, and I really just did not keep up with it, and the longer I went and got into that phase, it just ended up looking very, very rugged, and I really appreciated that about it. So that's not an example of anything we're talking about today, it's the opposite. <laughs> Some people are going to want to buy a guitar and just play the living daylights out of it, and for better or worse, and their own reasons, they might not want to keep it looking brand new. So that's that's neither good or bad, but that's one example of the guitars I own. Now you're basically talking about the Willie Nelson school of uh, guitars, where you know they get the the playing wear is is part of the mystique of the guitar, the the scratches and the dings and and so forth. But there's still some important things to worry about when it comes to guitars like that. So. Fast forward to a month ago, I received the brand new Martin D45 for Christmas from my lovely wife, who also gave me the 28V if you're keeping score at home. Uh -huh. And everything changed. That's a guitar that at this part of my life, I really want to make an effort to keep that guitar looking exactly brand new. I took good care of that guitar for everyone else because it was in our inventory for almost six months. So I got used to keeping that guitar looking really pretty. And I'm taking the mindset there Let's keep that guitar looking just like it does when it came out of Martin. So I'm going to have both sides of the flip of the coin here, if that makes any sense. My D45 is a guitar that I want to keep looking new. So there are two schools of thought, and for better or worse, I subscribe to both of them, uh, dependent on exactly the instrument. Well, that's a very good point. I, I remember many years ago, I went to see uh, the Twanglers at a club in New York City. And the girl I was interested in at the time girl, she was older than I was, but uh, the, the lady that I was interested in at the time was very into line dancing and all that stuff. This is how long ago it was. So I, I went along and watched her dance with all kinds of people doing that kind of uh, Texas style line dancing um, and fascinated with the band and uh, the, the lovely voiced lead singer and the really great lead guitar player whose name is, escapes me right now. But at the end of the show, now he was playing, I know he's playing a Martin, she's playing a Martin. His, he had a, what looked like what you kind of described as a, you know, a, a road warrior, you know, and you mentioned that, that phrase in the past. And that's certainly what your OM28V is. And that's what his uh, big Martin Dreadnought was, as well as his Telecaster and, and, uh, and uh, Stratocaster and all that. And these were all war road warrior guitars and long time touring guitars and honky-tonk guitars. And at the end of the show, I was fascinated to watch him take out uh, you know, every case had a polishing cloth 
and he wiped down every last possible inch quickly but methodically on every guitar huh. and you know the necks the frets they everything and the tuners and all that they wiped them all down before they went in the case and then the wow and then the cloth went on top of the guitar and he closed them up so why would you why would somebody do that well i'll tell you why <laughs> because the oils on your hands I mean, you get on, whether you wash your hands before you play a guitar or not, the oils on your hands will stay on that instrument. And at least when you come to Martin's, this is natural nitrocellulose lacquer that may look like an impervious floor wax, like the, like the kind of modern finishes that are on tailors and calling guitars, but it's not. And it actually breathes. And it's actually uh, different kind of materials and oils can affect this, you know, can affect your instrument, can affect the uh, strings, that can affect, I mean, all we have to do is mention the name Tim Perry and people immediately start telling stories about how his <laughs> natural perspiration corrodes guitar strings and probably frets too. And um, <laughs> and so, so, and maybe this guy was one of those kind of guys, maybe he'd learned that. But even with the kind of Road Warrior guitars that you and I both own, how many of us, I finished a long night having a great time and we're at Martin Festival, wherever we are, and you go to put your guitar away and the light hits it just right. And you see all of the saliva from the, the oh. singing, you and other people singing all over your top <laughs> of your guitar. Looks like a crime scene. <laughs> or or the beer or the, you know, that's Dr. Pepper or whatever. So, so that's one of the first things I want to bring up is, is that kind of cleaning. Now, there are, there's certainly products out there to clean your guitar with, in addition to, you know, just warm water and a paper towel and followed up by, you know, microfiber polishing cloth, that sort of thing. There is a long time tradition of using rosinol, which is the literally lighter fluid. And that's good for getting muck off of fi uh, nitrocellulose finishes. Little bit, you only want to use a little bit and you clearly want to be careful. It's extremely flammable. You want to throw all the rags away and it uh, evaporates very quickly and then you just use some water, you know, you don't even probably even need to use water, but uh, coating of water. But also for people who are much more interested in products and like to know they're getting a professional level product, there's uh, brands out there that sell usually the same companies that make the guitar polishes. So, you know, that's something to think about. Uh, it's also important nitrocellulose lacquers can be damaged by unnatural uh, polymers. And uh, you have to be careful about leaving your Martin guitar uh, leaning up against a Naga high chair, for example, and um, uh, anything with silicone in it, because it can actually damage the, if it's there too long, it'll actually start to melt the finish. And another thing that can melt the finish is insect repellent uh, off. I've seen somebody who you know, was playing campfire songs and stuff like that. Everybody was wearing off and his forearm was resting on the top of his D28. And the next day mm -hmm. it had all blistered up in a patch that was all like wavy and not quite bubbles, but it was like, you know, it almost looked like skin that had been suffered burns. And, um, and apparently I learned later that, you know, it's some local guy was able to make that all go away somehow, probably either some way of heating up the finish or doing something to it and was able to like make that disappear. So, but so, you know, it does matter and you do have to be careful with this stuff. And, you know, if you don't care about your own, uh, your own essence getting all over your guitar, um, that's fine. But I know there's certain people at least, you know, at least once a year before they go to Martin Fest, they're usually cleaning their guitars because they know they're going to be showing them off. So what about Mari's music? Do you sell a uh, guitar? cleaning products and, uh, you know, finished products and, and for that matter, uh, fretboards and fretboard oil. We do. And in an effort to keep this podcast evergreen, I don't want to name too many specific items because by the time you listen to this, it might be changing. But currently we offer products from Planet Waves Diodario. They make some good stuff. There's a company called Virtuoso that makes a polish and a cleaner that we really like. Uh, Lizard Spit, we, uh, we have those things from time to time, although that's pretty tough to get in stock uh, while we're taping this. But they're the three brands I could think of right away that, that I go to. And it's not uncommon for me to, to probably reach for the, the Virtuoso is, is my favorite. When you mention fingerboard oil, it's the fingerboard of everything we're talking about, from my experience, probably needs the least amount of attention or 
the amount of attention least often, it wouldn't surprise me if I only, maybe once a year, you could put just a little bit of a, a drop on maybe the first fret, the fifth fret, the 10th fret, get a little rag and that's gonna be fine. Like you said, in the spirit of keeping things from becoming problems more than repairing problems, if you clean your guitar, maybe on the average of once a week, I wouldn't feel wrong to tell our listeners, consider getting a, a microfiber cloth, either get it a little bit damp with warm water or something like lizard spit or Diodario Planet Waves make something called shine. And just a little bit, it's not necessarily like we're going in uncovering years and years of problems, but you're gonna take just the surface problems away and if once a week you hit the top, back, and sides of your guitar with, with a microfiber cloth and a little bit of spray, you'd be surprised not only how good it looks very quickly, but it keeps it looking good for another week or so. And doing that semi-regularly will certainly make your guitar look as nice as it can. And I'm speaking from the point of view, keeping it looking nice because it still does. There's a second part of that answer. If you've sort of neglected your guitar, maybe you bought a used guitar or the guitar is just been a little bit uh, ignored more than you want to admit, you can go and clean more than polish. So we should talk about that too, Spoon. You can get cleaner, polish, or combinations of both. The long and short answer is if you're going to get a cleaner that's a little bit more aggressive and a polish is going to be a little more smooth. So if your guitar needs to be cleaned before it's polished, a cleaner, you know, just as often might really do the trick. And the same thing applies. The, the Virtuoso brand that we really like makes a cleaner and a polish. And I'd go on record saying that's what I reach for uh, when I want to take something from inventory. As you know, I do a lot of uh, YouTube videos. And if I'm done playing a D41 Ambertone, let's be honest, it's not going to look completely the same after I'm done playing two or three songs. I'm very, very careful, but there's going to be a fingerprint here and there. And I really like just, you know, kissing that a little bit. Less is more. Uh, in the spirit of this whole podcast, we're never going to talk about dumping something on the guitar, uh, really working with a bunch of elbow grease. It's pretty minimalist, but a little bit can really go a long way. So yes, before we get into polish, again, cleaning is really more about stuff that got on the guitar. The gunky stuff, the, the, the you know, spots here and there of egg salad or whatever it might be that had <laughs> ended up on the guitar. And, and doing that once in a while, but also it's a good idea to give it a, a, a you know a good cleaning if you're going to give it a polishing, if you haven't done it in a long time. What you had just mentioned a little bit goes a long way, and a microfiber cloth. A lot of microfiber cloths will actually use the oils on that are from your hands, and you don't might not even need to add anything at all when it comes to just just you know wiping down a guitar and uh, or even a, you know just a couple drops of water is all you need to get a little bit of moisture in there um, i knew somebody who was a uh, a long time repairman here and when they would polish guitars they used virtuoso the virtuoso brand that you mentioned I'm talking about rudy pensa uh, his but his daughter runs the shop now rudy's that's down in soho but rudy always applied uh virtuoso polish with his fingertips not with a cloth and he felt like when you used your fingertips, this was his theory that the oil and the water in the polish would separate just briefly. And you would get a little bit of moisture underneath the oils in the polish. And I have no idea how scientific this is, but he would rub it in with his fingertips first. And he felt that that was very important and then would apply the cloth. So, you know, there's, there's all kinds of different ways to do this, but I always thought that was fascinating. And I have to say, I used to do it. I don't, I'm, I must confess, I don't polish my guitars nearly often enough. And I usually only clean them when I realize, hey, I should get that stuff off of there. But, uh, but I also take care of them and they live in the cases. And I don't, uh, you know, I'm, I don't, other than taking them to Prospect Park on a regular basis, uh, they're, they're not getting exposed to a lot of stuff except for the occasional, uh, gig in a very small place or, or, um, or of course the annual Martin Fest. So polishing, polishing uh, similar to uh, the same metaphor about dentistry. When I was a little boy and somebody showed me the little film strip in those days, but pre-video um, <laughs> that showed how when they clean your teeth and they polish your teeth, what they're really doing is they're going in at a very magnified level, they're going into where there's all these little pock marks and gouges in the enamel 
and they're polishing them away, just like you always hear about people polishing the silver in the old days, and how what they're doing is they're going in with a very, very fine abrasive and, and getting in there and wiping out all those little nooks and crannies. And that's why it reflects light, and that's why everything shines so nicely. Well, you're doing the same thing with your guitar, with the surface of your guitar. And what you're basically doing is preventing cavities in the finish that could lead to more and more problems down the line, uh, finish cracks and stuff like that that could expose the wood to the elements. So polishing is not just about making it look, you know, all squeaky clean and as shiny as Mr. Clean's head. Uh, it's about uh, <laughs> protecting protecting your uh, finish, no matter whether it's a polyurethane finish or a nitrocellulose finish. That's a really good point. It, it's uh, it's important for us to remind you, we're not just talking about vanity, and it's not just to say that if you're going to polish your guitar, you're just so worried about what your guitar looks like to someone else. You are taking care of it. I would kind of consider saying that a deep clean is step one, polishing is step two, and if you get on board early enough, you can keep doing step two and rarely, if ever, have to do step one, you know, besides the obvious... Uh, you know, extraneous problems that you might find if you play outside in August and you got to get the deep <laughs> stuff out. But if you're one of those players that after you play a few tunes in the summertime, it's just a mess. Uh, I'm going to take my own advice as I'm saying this. I'm having this D45 is really making me want to listen to this my own podcast later more than, you know, six months ago. If you would have said, let's talk about keeping guitars clean. I would have asked, why did you invite me? <laughs> well, but also, you know, those who are lucky enough to attend Martin Fest and spend three or four nights playing all night in song circle rooms and impromptu jams and letting a bunch of other people play your guitars. You're talking about a huge combination of people's uh, natural oils and whatever they snacks they were eating and all that. So it is, uh, that's even more important if you're, if you're in that kind of situation. At least when after it's all done, you can, you know, either daily or at the end of the weekend, uh, you know, make make sure your guitars kind of get back to their normal uh, state. And then there is a, you know, there's a third level that most people don't have to worry about, but everybody's familiar with getting their first ding or first scratch and how you get to pick scratches and stuff. And that really, you know, can really bother people who have showcase guitars and re it really matters to them a lot. And and so there are also products out there and have, you know, and you can talk to a professional repairman and find out what they use. For instance, Bob Jones, who, who is a, you know, a repairman to the stars uh, here in Brooklyn and was my guitar tech for many, many years, though he's basically retired now. Uh, he used, and I wish I could tell you what it was now. It, it's a, a, and I'm sure I'm just having a, uh, my own senior moment. I'm sure some of our listeners on YouTube may put this in the comments. It's a particular automotive polish. It is a particular brand and a particular grit. And that's what he uses as his guitar polish when he's getting rid of scratches. And, oh. um, and I know, I, I, it's, boy, if you, you know, yesterday I would have been able to tell you what it was. It's so-and-so's number nine or number three or whatever it was. Oh, probably McGuire's or uh, that's it. Mothers? It's McGuire's. Of course, that's what it is. It's McGuire's. It's McGuire's. By the way, I'm sorry. Uh, we need to uh, have a public service announcement right now before I forget. I just want to make it clear that no lizards were harmed in the collection of lizard spit to make lizard spit products. <laughs> so, yeah, so there is, you know, there is another step. However, here's a caveat for everybody. This is a disclaimer. This is uh, uh, purely the opinions of Spoon and Mari. And if you're ever in doubt with any of this stuff, you should seek out your own guitar tech person, somebody who's a professional, has a lot of experience, especially when it comes to like buffing out scratches on a finish or on a pick guard, or I mean, you're certainly free to do your own research and try things out. We have plenty of friends who do their own guitar maintenance all the time. Um, you know, I, Leo Kotke, you know, can, set his own necks, uh, though, you know, of course, he uses bulldog necks, but, um, you know, in the dressing room. So, you know, there are, you know, <laughs> people who are, who are better at this stuff than other people. So, but yes, you can, uh, you can do a lot to your finish to, to make it look better, including getting rid of a lot of scars and mars and, and people like Bob Jones could even make cracks disappear 
and you know repair cracks in solid wood guitars and and literally make them disappear which i always just thought was absolute magic and probably would have gotten him burned at the stake you know 600 years ago <laughs> but um i do want to echo that sentiment and say as much that it's extremely important that if you have an interest in doing this we're not saying don't learn it or don't try it but just find where you can really be properly educated and if you want to get into setups and cleanings and everything we're going to talk about before this is over uh, you definitely should. If you're, if you're the kind of person that wants to know more about this, the more you know, knowledge is power. And then even if you do let other people do things to your guitar, you'll know what to ask for. You'll know what to expect and how to critique what you're getting done. So don't put your head in the sand and say someone else should do this and I shouldn't look. But if you do have an interest, please get some education. We'll try to leave some good links in the show notes and the YouTube comment section if we can point you towards some great places to start looking for good information. But the important thing we want to say is learn about it and learn from someone else's mistakes and certainly take someone else's expertise into consideration. Don't just find the top two hits on Google. And, and if you read it, it's right. You know, just be, be aware is what we mean. Yes. And when it comes to what I typically do, when I change my strings, I, I have a very nice polished cloth uh, for each guitar. And that's the time when I'll be able to get in and get the dust out from under where the strings normally are. And, you know, and on the fretboard and on the headstock. And I'm have only used uh, oil on the fingerboard on guitars that had the kind of fingerboard that seemed quite porous with lots of little micro cracks and stuff like that. I have not always used it on every fretboard. I don't mind if there's some, you know, film or discoloration or schmutz, as they like to say in New York City, <laughs> uh, around the frets and stuff. And, and you know, some, some uh, ebony fingerboards will discolor a little bit, things like that. I, I you know, I don't, I don't mind that sort of thing. Um, I do, uh, you know, like I said, wash my guitars when I feel like it's necessary or bathe them, as I call it. And this podcast is making me realize that it's been too long since my guitars have been polished. And given the uh, time of year um, when we have to start thinking about uh, care and maintenance a little more, um, that's, you know, it, it's, uh, that's usually about the time I tend to do it. You had mentioned setup, and there's a lot of people, for a lot of people, that's a mysterious word that conjures up a certain kind of alchemy that's required of professional setup artists to do correctly. But there's definitely certain things that people can do for their own guitars at home that uh, uh, it only takes uh, educating themselves, as, as Mari just said. And one of them is tuner maintenance. These days, Martin has gone with vintage looking open back tuners on almost every inst instrument, which means that the gears are completely exposed in the back. And Mario is famous for saying less is more, and he says it all the time. And when it comes to, if you want all of your tuners to have the same sort of tightness or looseness, uh, it's something you can do yourself if you have the right screwdriver, but you just have to be very, you know, you just wanna be conscious of a little adjustment goes a long way. And just about anything we're going to talk about henceforth is less is more, and you can always uh, at, you can always do a little more. It's sometimes impossible to do to undo what you did. So you know minor adjustments to, to get that one tuner to turn like the others is pretty easy to do. You usually can tell if you need to add oil, and you're talking about a tiny drop of oil. I think linseed oil is, is popular, but I'm sure there's specific oils out there you can buy that are specific for uh, guitar gearage, you know, probably used in electric guitars more than acoustic. But you're talking about a tiny, tiny drop because that oil will spread out all over the place and you'll just end up having to wipe it off. But um, you're not really talking more than once a year if you even need that. I imagine if you're in a very arid climate, you might need to do it more often. Closed tuners, in, uh, in closed tuners, particularly vintage style and closed tuners, actually have a little hole where you add oil. But modern closed tuners like you will find on the Martin D35 and the Martin M36, uh, which they keep for legacy reasons because those are the tuners that were used back when those good guitars came out and were popular, have a, are purely, truly enclosed and have a lifetime's worth of you know, lubricant that'll last forever in there. So you don't really have to worry about those types. But can you think of anything else about uh, tuning machines that you can think of that might need some maintenance? 
Not specifically, but I want to probably add one little caution to almost every little piece of this episode, talking about doing something with the tuners, whether you're going to do a, a little bit of a screwdriver turn or just, the, I mean, like the tip of a toothpick amount of oil into the tuner. Assume every single time you do it, you're going to put it all over the headstock. Assume you're going to slip with the wrench or the <laughs> screwdriver and scratch something. Go into it thinking like that, and that'll make it even a little bit more careful. And there are some jigs you can make up or even buy online. Uh, out of cardboard or plastic that uh, there's a good video Martin put up on YouTube uh, many weeks ago where they were doing some setups and just assume you're going to slip and that'll really keep it in, in the front of your mind that you don't want to scratch your guitar you don't want to you know get any oil all over the place just be careful and if you think of it in those terms it'll make you a little bit more careful and, and I want to circle back really quickly the same exact thing happened to me probably three or four years ago and I, I I don't know if this is the part of the podcast where you embarrass yourself, but I'm going to dive right in. Talking about lightly cleaning your guitar or polishing your guitar with a microfiber cloth, do it in little pieces. And instead of taking the attitude where you're going to get your hand all over the cloth and completely clean the back of the guitar, grab the microfiber cloth carefully, clean a very small area, and check it. Clean the next neighbor and check it. Check it every couple of seconds and only do a little bit at a time. There are times where you can get a little bit of dried residue on a microfiber cloth whether it's a piece of dirt or something similar even caked on any anything that was on your setup desk if you're not watching and you do the whole back you might have just pushed that little piece of a stone or sawdust all over the back of the guitar and you'd rather find out as soon as you started doing it than oh, oh dear i've put it all over the back of the guitar so always assume you're doing something either incorrect or you know something was contaminated because if you catch it early believe me i speak from experience you're going to be so much happier than oh my god what did i just put all over the back of that guitar mm -hmm. that's a cautionary tale from the birthday boy so thank you for stepping <laughs> up and and letting us know what kind of fool you are um no um <laughs> but uh the scratches that i have put in that drive me crazy that for some reason I just keep doing it even though I try not to come from the tips of strings when I'm putting them through uh, the tuning machine. And mm. I'll do it as carefully as I can and it's almost like at the last second they dive down and just push up this little curl of finish. It's like, no, not again. But so my headstocks have lots of those little scratches and it's really annoying. <laughs> not that anybody will ever really notice or care. I get more than enough dings and things from from uh, from just you know playing and and uh, playing close quarters with other people and things knocking together and all that. But still, it's like every time I add one, it makes me growl at myself. Um, and here's <laughs> I just want to bring this up too for for people because I've also done it too, trying to in the summer when the wood's swollen and trying to get pins out of the bridge and, and one of them's very stubborn and won't come out. And having one of those pin lifter tools just pop off of it and i put a a, a ding in my top when i was changing strings and just things like that that people can't help and sometimes my mind wanders or you know you just like you like mari is saying if you go into it assuming that kind of thing's going to happen you'll probably cut down on th that kind of thing happening because you're, you're being extra cautious uh, when you need to be um, but there is a product that uh, I think Mario Music still may have one or two of them. They're handmade by a woman in England, and they're basically a guitar apron that sits on top of your guitar while you're doing any kind on the top, while you're doing any kind of bridge maintenance or anything like that. And for people who have those kind of serious showcase guitars like Mari's D45, uh, do you guys still have any of those for sale? We have a couple left over. They're called the Dingo and Q Elaine from uh, Seinfeld. But Dingo, I think you're right. They're really, really helpful. It's basically a protective little carpet that's the shape of a dreadnought or the shape of a double O. Lay it on top of the guitar. And, you know, not that I would want to test that out on purpose, but if you drop a pliers on top of the guitar, it's not going to hurt it. So we just did a couple of installs this morning, uh, K&K pickups and some Martin guitars. And where I'm sitting here in the podcast studio, I could almost reach my dingo, and it's it's invaluable. You really can uh, put it on top of the guitar, tape up the sound hole so nothing can uh, move it around. And, and after a couple of extra minutes of being careful, you can do things like a string change or anything that it just takes the guitar's top 
out of the equation. And the, the spirit of that message is even if it's not that product, uh, you know, get a couple of towels. Uh, again, just assume you're going to be dropping something on the guitar's top. What would you do if you can go back in time and put something in, in, in its place in the way? So that, that's certainly something you want to keep. I mean, I, I, I still... I still get shivers remembering walking past our friend John Hall at Martinfest doing K and K installations at Martinfest without I don't think he had anything on the top of the guitar the whole afternoon. I can't do an installation with anybody watching me at all. I can't do it in a hurry with the protective top on the cover. And it's you know, some everybody's got their own methods, but if I'm gonna be able to use this program to tell you what my methods are, extra, extra caution. I've never gone home from a day at work being upset that I lost three minutes, being too careful to do something. Because there are times you just, you're just so happy you, you covered it up. But the dingo is the product you're thinking about. Well, it's, yes, thank you. That's exactly what I was thinking about. And, and you know, I have one. And I should have been using it the day that I did that, you know. And, you know, it, is a, it was a lesson learned. So, so um, like you said, you know, there's some people don't care that much about it. Some people's guitars already look like Willie Nelson's guitar, so one more ding isn't going to bother them. I prefer my dings to be limited uh, to souvenirs. Like, you know, um, I know dings that came from a Martin Fest, and it was like, yeah, it's a ding. You know, somebody's guitar turned around and whacked my guitar. But it also brings back the memory of that Martin Fest or a particular gig that I was at, you know, that kind of thing. But so, you know, so that's basically the the – basic maintenance, cleaning maintenance, and that sort of thing. You were talking about doing pickup installs. I know people who do their own pickup installs, whether it's a K and K or an under saddle pickup or whatever. I've never ventured into that sort of thing. Um, but I do, you know, some little setup stuff here and there. So maybe it's a good time to, to talk to a Martin dealer who has a great deal of experience uh, about what does setup actually mean and what does uh, Mari's music do when somebody comes to them as a customer and says, I'd like you to set this up. It hasn't had a setup in a couple of years. And, um, and then maybe we can talk about the sorts of things that people uh, do at home on their own that they might be able to accomplish versus the stuff that they might want to seek a professional uh, hand to be involved. Absolutely. And I'll echo Spoon sentiment a few minutes ago. Again, these are the views and opinions of Maury's Music and Spoon Phillips. Uh, take it all for what it's worth, a grain of salt. What I really feel uh, I can talk about as a setup is going to be the basic geometry, so to speak, of the way that the guitar is set up for the string height or action at the nut, at the saddle, the amount of neck relief that's in the neck between the first fret and the 14th fret, and the guitar that comes out of Martin is going to be right around 45% humidity when it goes to the store. Here at Maury's Music, we keep the same humidity and temperature. So going from Martin into my van, into our store, there's been no change in humidity and temperature, so, so we're still good there. When it goes to FedEx, UPS, to your, your local store or your home, you have to take into consideration if the guitar dries out a little bit, the guitar's top is going to sink or raise depending on the humidity and the temperature. If the guitar gets a little bit dry, the guitar's top will sink. Not a lot, but it'll sink a little bit. And the opposite is true. If the guitar gets a little bit wet, and when we say wet, we mean a little bit too humid, even temporarily, the guitar's top can rise. And if you can picture this, put your guitar on a table and look at it from the profile point of view. If you could see the left-hand part of the picture is the guitar's nut, the right-hand part of the picture is the guitar's bridge. Behind the bridge, that belly of the guitar, if that's going to raise with excess humidity, it's going to bring the action a little bit tall. If it sinks, it's going to bring the action a little bit down. So there's this fight that never really stops happening for weeks and months, frankly, when a guitar is brand new, begins settling in at your dealer, in your living room, there's movement. So you can be completely happy with the way a guitar plays a few weeks later, be a little bit unhappy, get worried, a couple days after that, it goes back to normal. There's there's a little bit of time that t has that takes place until the guitar is really done doing a lot of its movement. What I mean to say is the setup takes the, into consideration all those things, and you can lower or raise the action at the nut, at the saddle, and make it playable to your point of view. And this is where it becomes really personal preference. There's a lot of good 
places for starting points. You can go on the internet and find a lot of good, here's where to start type things. But a good tech, it doesn't have to be a luthier. You don't have to go to somebody who can build a guitar. You have to go to somebody who can set up a guitar. A good tech will take into consideration how much neck relief should be on the guitar. And that's basically the, if you hold the guitar string down, say, use the G string as a straight edge. Put a capo on the first fret, hold the G string at the 14th fret, and now you have a ruler that's basically a, the, the third string. Look and see how much distance there is between the top of the seventh fret and that string, and that's relief. Because contrary to popular belief, you don't want a neck that is so perfectly dead flat that there's no space there, otherwise you'll get you'll get buzz. You want it to be almost flat, and that's that's for another podcast, but suffice it to say, you want to get that figured out first. If you don't figure out and adjust and set up the neck relief first, the things you do next are going to either be incorrect or creating one problem to fix another. So the first thing you want to do is make sure your, your relief is where it should be, and only after you've done that you can take a look at the nut. If the strings are too high at the nut, you need to have six files because each nut slot is going to be its own diameter. Uh, the, the base E string needs a lot more room to move around than the B does. If any of those nut slots are not deep enough, you have to make them deeper with a file. After that's finished, you can go to the saddle. And if you still have action that needs to be either raised or lowered, you have to raise the saddle or lower the saddle. And those three things in conjunction, taking into consideration that the belly and the top of the guitar is neutral, that's your setup. When you do all that work, you can find that your guitar moves over time in humidity and temperature. It's still not safe to say that it'll never lower or it'll never raise with humidity and temperature. But if you keep your guitar in the environment it should be in and the guitar has stabilized, that's what a setup does. If you want to learn how to do that, the more you know about that, the more you can express what you want and expect from the tech that's going to set it up too. So the more you can find out about this subject, the better. Even if you're not sure you want to ever want to do it yourself, it's a really fascinating little bit of science. It's not smoke and mirrors. It's not hype. And there's no magician involved. But if you understand what I just described, how they relate to each other, you can either express to a competent tech what you expect and want, or you could even get into doing it yourself, and it really can make a guitar so much more fun to play compared to playing something that's needlessly too high. Well, yes, and it also makes it uh, more fun to hear because uh, we're often talking about buzzing when it, it uh, comes to wanting to make these kind of changes. There's different kinds of buzzing. There's buzzing, uh, and for the most part, we're talking about buzzing where the string is actually making contact with the fret someplace. Um, but that's not the only kind of buzzing. Sometimes a, a string can buzz because the bridge pin is set incorrectly. Sometimes it has something to do with either a string is buzzing or the string is impinged somewhere and it's not as loud, doesn't sustain the way it's supposed to. That can be caused by the nut or saddle slot. So you want to, you know, one of the first things I would do when it comes to buzzing is, is take the string down, take the bridge pin out, reset it, bring it back up and make sure that wasn't all there was to it. Um, check the slots too to see if, uh, make sure it's you know coming through the slot of the bridge correctly, make sure it's in the slot of the nut correctly. Mari spoke of using files to take the nut slots down. Well, if a nut slot has been worn down too much, uh, there are techs out there who know how to use uh, material to fill the slot instead of having to pay money to get an entirely new uh, nut, uh, you know, take that nut, off, steam that nut to get the glue uh, loose so you can take the nut off and pay to have a whole new nut made. Sometimes techs can can fill it. And I've seen people fill, you know, do their own work over the years that, you know, fill it with various stuff. One trick that somebody showed me a long time ago, I don't remember if it was Bob Jones or not, was using graphite uh, pencil lead to to do a little bit of work in the nut slots to uh, kind of file out any little snags and stuff, you know, to smooth it out, basically. And you can do that on the nut or the saddle if you suspect that there's something about a slot that, that you know, might just need to, you know, just, just need a little bit of polishing itself inside there. 
Um, there's the little things you can do. And a lot of this stuff, as Mari said, you can find guides online about all this sort of thing, you know, of uh, collective knowledge of people. Uh, and if, you know, any of these things sound a little too far fetched, well, you want to make sure you're doing research. Don't take one source's word for it. Make sure it's, you know, something that is backed up by multiple uh, opinions and, um, and expertise. For example, uh, somebody wrote me, uh, somebody who's a one man's guitar reader, and he uh, wrote me and he was so proud. He was all ready to, to clean his nitrocellulose finish on his standard series Martin guitar. He went out and he had, had acquired his bottle of acetate, a uh, fingernail polish <gasps> removing. <laughs> So fortunately, I was able to say, uh, no. <laughs> Stop the presses. Yeah, that people had said use, uh, use NAMFA, light, you know, light, lighter fluid, not, uh, not nail polish remover, which of course would have absolutely destroyed his nitrocellulose finish. Oh so, my God. Um, so I have no idea whether he was misremembering NAMFA or what it was, but somehow, he had got it in his head that he was supposed to use uh, fingernail polish remover. But um, let us know in the comments if you're that guy. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, and who knows, maybe he's actually a listener of Martin's and more and, and is uh, over there in the corner now with his head in a bucket <laughs> of embarrassment. <laughs> no, um, but uh, no, his secret's safe with me. We've all we've all done almost done things with, you know, without thinking them through. So, um, so to go back to where Mari was talking about the traditional setup where he's putting relief in the neck or taking relief out of the neck, Mari's music has an excellent guide on YouTube about how to adjust the truss rod to change the relief of the neck. So I highly recommend that. But could you uh, give us a quick overview of adjusting a truss rod and a modern Martin, we're talking the modern Martins today with the two-way adjustable rod that require a, a wrench that's a little longer than the old wrench. And just a very quick overview of the steps involved in, and why you're doing it. Oh, I'm happy to. Uh, the modern Martins, they do have a recessed truss rod that really you need the longer wrench. What you want to do is when you engage that truss rod, turning the truss rod wrench counterclockwise will loosen the truss rod and increase or add relief and when you turn the truss rod clockwise you're tightening it and you are taking away or removing relief and what you want to do is get the relief within spec and, and you can certainly refer to our website or martin's website on exactly how much that you want to have and it's it can be a personal preference as well but to get the right amount dialed in you want to turn the wrench and that's the first step to marry that to conversation we had earlier you got to do that first, even though a side effect of doing this changes the action of the guitar. That is not the way to adjust your action. It's going to be a side effect, but adjusting the neck relief with the truss rod wrench is not the way to achieve action height. It just ends up being a side effect of it. Also, when he refers to counterclockwise and clockwise, counterclockwise is, is tilting the wrench toward the bass strings. Clockwise is tilting the wrench toward the treble strings. And you're not tilting it very much, are you? No, not at all. You want to do a quarter turn at a time. When you're saying quarter turn, you're talking about from 12 o'clock to 9 o'clock or 12 o'clock to 3 o'clock as if you could have turned that wrench all the way around. Yes, would be a full turn. Yes, and I'll, I'll make a really, really bad dad joke. That's on a clock face. Don't start turning the wrench at 12 o'clock and wait until 3 o'clock to stop turning it. <laughs> but dad, okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, I'm, you never know. I'm glad you mentioned that because there might be somebody out there still drumming their fingers on the desk waiting for 3 o'clock. But, um, <laughs> but okay, so, so then so what's the point of changing the relief? Why do you do it and why, why do you want to do it? Well, the, you want to have just a little bit of it because that lets the string vibrate and get out of its own way. If you don't have enough neck relief, you're going to have string buzz. And if you have too much neck relief, the playability is going to suffer. The intonation is going to suffer. If you can picture this, they're very, very small increments. But every time you do loosen or tighten the truss rod, you're in effect changing the length of the string from nut to saddle. 
just a little bit, and I mean it's it's splitting hairs, but when you loosen the truss rod and you allow the string tension to pull the neck, to the headstock towards the, the bridge of the guitar very slightly, you're basically shortening the distance from nut to saddle. You're making the, the string action higher as a side effect, and that's going to play into the intonation as well. So the amount of neck relief plays a very important role in knowing that there's just enough relief in the neck to prevent buzzing, but not excess to harm playability. And that's just, it's still, it's the first step in making sure that your setup is correct. So we're still talking about raising the string so it's not contacting a fret, but it's not action in the sense of playability of uh, how high the strings are for your fretting hands comfort or how high the strings are over the sound hole and that sort of thing. Well, it's a little bit of both. I, sh I should stop you there so I don't mislead anybody. It, some of that is true. Like it's the, the neck relief only affects the part of the string from the first fret to the body fret more or less. So fr frets one to 13 or one to 14, you're in effect changing how flat that geometry is, but it doesn't make anything more or less playable uh, between the or the fret where the fingerboard meets the body and the bridge so you in effect you could have a very low saddle low action at the 12th fret and it looks like it's going to play comfortable but also at the same time have too much neck relief and you'll wonder why do i have a guitar that's not easy to play the action is so low at the 12th fret well because you have a big dip you're basically making a, a big scoop from fret 1 to fret 14 um, so your left hand is going to notice playability issues with improper or I should say added unnecessary uh, neck relief where your action at the 12th fret might look okay because of what you've done to the saddle. So it's kind of two problems that happen independent of each other. So let me ask you this, Dr. Mari. Let's say we have an anonymous patient who says that my guitar does not buzz uh, when the strings aren't fretted and it doesn't buzz when I'm playing, but when I put a capo on the second fret or fourth fret, then it starts to buzz when I'm trying to play um, up the neck and I'm getting little sitar buzzes when I'm fretting uh, or when I'm using a capo. So what would cause that and what would be the first aid for that? That's a little bit hard to, to diagnose really quickly on a, uh, on a podcast like this to give the, the listeners the attention it deserves, but I would go back to checking the neck relief and checking for a high fret. There, there might be a situation where if you picture there's 14, 15 frets from, you know, going from the body of the guitar back towards the, uh, the headstock, if any one of those frets isn't as tall as it's supposed to be, uh, especially depending on where you put the cable, that could be a culprit. And assuming that the neck relief already is okay, it's probably fret work, and I'm a little hesitant to, to dive too far into things. I, I can't explain it as well as I understand it, but that's, that's what I would begin to do and take my own advice. I would get into researching that and talk to people that I know have a deeper understanding of that, but that's what I'd look at first. So fascinating. So, so it could be just a high fret or it's, it still could be relief related, and that could change over the year. Uh, one thing that can also change over the year um, because of the change in humidity, uh, which you've mentioned, is the saddle height because of the either the belly raising up or the top in front of the bridge, between the bridge and the sound hole sinking down, uh, which both can have that effect. In the old days, it was very common for guitarists, particularly professional guitarists, who were going in and out of different environments all the time, uh, to have more than one saddle. And it was very common... Uh, in the 1960s and 1970s, before we were old enough to actually, you know, be among these kind of people, um, they would have a winter saddle and a summer saddle, as they called it, because of the change in humidity and dryness, depending on your part of the country. And that would, uh, in those days, Old Martins, the saddle was actually glued in, so people would have to actually have to blow out, as they would call it in those days, the saddle, get rid of the saddle, and make two new saddles, at least two new saddles, one for when uh, things got really dry and one when things got uh, very humid in the summer so that a player could just change out their saddle. And I know many people our age and younger who still make their own saddles or make them for their friends. So that's something people can look up 
uh, that's something, or they can t- again turn to a professional um, like Mari Rutsch or anybody uh, else in their area that they trust that might be able to make a saddle for them if they if they need a new saddle or if they want to try the idea of having a, a slightly taller saddle and a slightly lower saddle. You know, a lot of people don't care about buzzing because they really don't play above the fifth fret. And I bought a used OM28VR uh, years ago that you could not play above the fifth fret. Somebody had the saddle taken down so low and the neck was so flat that it was basically a sitar. Um, oh. And it was somebody that just never, you know, never, somebody who just only played and, and really the first three positions and played the basic, you know, what open chords and, um, and maybe, you know, maybe barred his F and B minor and had the guitar, you know, for some years and didn't even know. He clearly had it set up ultra, ultra low. Another friend of mine took his guitar, brand his brand new Martin guitar in to get a setup and it came back buzzing like mad because the people at the name brand chain store uh, were all very young and and basically heavy metal guitar player types used to electric guitars and they set it up like an electric guitar with super super low action so um and maybe to them maybe they're so used to playing so lightly with very light strings that it sounded fine to them where he you know it just buzzed all over the place and he had to go back and the uh much more uh mature owner of the place or the lead head manager or whoever it was uh then set it up you know like a martin guitar should be set up and he's been totally <laughs> happy with it ever after but uh, so you want to be careful about that too a lot of people I, I want my guitar set up uh, higher. I think Martin's uh, come way too low now, but I know they're marketing to people who grew up playing electric guitars. And I always have to ask when I, if I've ever gotten a brand new Martin guitar, I've always had to have the action raised because I play too hard and I press too, I press fret harder than I should and I waggle around and I, but I, you know, I just, I put a lot of emotion and energy in my playing and, um, and I do not like having to, you know, ease off to keep a guitar from from buzzing. You know, I expect them to buzz this time of year um, because of the dryness. You know, you can only do so much with humidification. But you know, there's there's lots of reasons for people to get their guitars set up. It's not like you just set it up the day it comes home, uh, you know, wrapped in its pink or blue blanket. <laughs> and it never again needs to go to the doctor. You know, it, uh, the, you know, setups are, uh, setups are very welcome things, even if people can go by years without them, just like changing your string. Sometimes when you finally do it or have it done for you, then you're like, wow, why didn't I do this sooner? So, uh, yeah, I want to say that if you bring a guitar home and, and you really love it and months later, weeks later, it needs attention. Don't think of that as something wrong. Don't be upset with the store, with the manufacturer. That's not saying, hey, what happened to this? It's not fun anymore. It's going to need some attention from time to time. And maybe even more importantly to mention what I I would have liked to have said sooner, if you get a guitar and you're not sure you like it, you love the style, you love the sound, but it doesn't really play that well, don't immediately return it or try to get out of it without considering talking to somebody about a setup. It just might not fit for you. It might be like buying a jacket and you love it, but it just doesn't look that right, don't buy a completely different jacket. Don't give up on the guitar until you've talked about the, the merits of a setup with somebody you trust. And even if you end up hearing that advice and not taking it, it, it is sad to hear some people say, I want to give this guitar back. I, I hate the way it plays. My other guitar plays so much easier. These guitars are meant to be tailored to you, meant to be set up at the beginning and again. So keep that in mind too, whether you're just brand new to the instrument or even if it's a used instrument consider that a setup for your style to your personal preferences really should be you should exhaust that before you give up on something absolutely and and it's important to remember that you're going to uh, get more than one opinion out there and so you you know you just have to uh, take uh, into consideration and also try to be clear when you speak to people about why your other guitar plays so well and and what uh, you don't like about the, the other guitar because it's entirely possible 
that that will lead them toward adjusting your new guitar so that it plays uh, much more like your old guitar. Exactly. Now I've uh, hinted at, I hit it more than once about, you know, changes in humidity that can cause these things. And, and Mari mentioned that at the very beginning. So we will be doing another podcast in the future um, about the importance of caring for your guitar when it comes to not just humidity, but the environment that your guitar lives in, the environment that your guitar has to travel through and spend time in, and um, what you can do at home to uh, protect your guitar from, from the elements. I couldn't agree more. That's a topic that deserves its own podcast altogether, and we certainly don't want to rush through any of that stuff for sure. So maybe that's when the music comes in. Come on, wake up. Poke him. Poke that guy with the stick. <laughs> <laughs> well, Spoon, you know what the music means. I think it's almost <laughs> time for us to go home and clean our guitars. Yes, indeed. This has been an eye-opening uh, podcast and a mind-opening podcast. And it's reminding me that it's been too long since I have cleaned and polished my guitars. So I've got a, uh, a very uh, important surprise birthday party coming up. And uh, I've been asked to supply guitars for the out-of-towners. So I'm going to make sure they're, they're all up to spoon standard before they get shown off. Sounds good to me. From all of us at Maury's Music, thanks for listening. Hear you later. This has been a presentation of Maury's Music, your trusted source for Martin and Blue Ridge guitars. Find us online at maurysmusic.com. <laughs>